In this lesson, we are looking at chromosome abnormalities and we are following on from looking at mutations in genes. So we've looked at genetic abnormalities in the context of gene mutations. Now we also need to consider the possibility of larger changes occurring at a whole chromosome level. So essentially we're zooming out to look at a large number of genes um, at once being affected. So chromosome abnormalities can be viewed in many ways, and one of which is by viewing a carrier type. So a carrier type is a way of displaying chromosomes uh, which orders them with their homologous pair, and it orders them numerically. So typically we go uh, from the largest to the smallest, with a few exceptions, and you're also going to see uh, sex chromosomes in there. So this way chromosomes can be an sorry, analyzed to determine whether there are any abnormalities at a chromosome level. So in my former life as a cytogeneticist, this is what I did all day, prepare arrange and analyze chromosomes to find the abnormalities. So my job was to prepare cell cultures for people having their chromosomes checked, uh, grow their cells, arrest the cell cycle at, um, you know, in, in metaphase, in mitosis, drop them out onto a microscope slide, stain them, photograph them, and then analyze them. So to analyze them, each individual chromosome has to be digitally cut out. Uh, previously, it was actually photographed and cut out with scissors and glued down. Um, and they have to be arranged with their homologous pair so they can be compared to one another. And the banding patterns or the staining patterns on these chromosomes um, are specific to that pair and they're consistent. So we should be able to compare with the homologous chromosome and then uh, around with the other ones. So chromosome abnormalities are often called block mutations and large sections of the chromosomes can be affected. And these abnormalities usually arise at my, uh, during meiosis and very often during the bivalent formation as part of crossing over at, in uh, meiosis one. So the most commonly seen chromosome abnormalities are duplications, uh, inversions, deletions, insertions, and translocations. Some sound very similar to those point mutations, but this time we're talking large chunks of a chromosome. Now, some some of these are really rare, uh, some of them are surprisingly common in the general population, and some have really big significant outcomes, others can be silent or quite invisible, and it really depends on which chromosome is affected, where on that chromosome, which genes are impacted, all that kind of thing. Now, aneuploidy occurs when there is a variation in the number of chromosomes which appear in that cell line. So essentially it describes the addition or loss of an entire chromosome, and these situations frequently arise at meiosis. So normally during the first division in meiosis, the homologous pairs of chromosomes pair up and they segregate through independent assortments. So one of each of the pairs goes in opposite direction into the new daughter cells. But if this goes wrong and their pair, the pair don't split up, then two can end up in one of the daughter cells while the other is left with none of that homologous pair. So here we're seeing aneuploidy where there's three of something, here we're seeing aneuploidy where there's only uh, one sex chromosome. Now this process uh, of the non-splitting correctly is known as disjunction, and it results in aneuploidy in organisms once the gametes fuse at fertilization. So non-disjunction can occur during independent assortment in meiosis 1, but it can also occur in meiosis 2 if sister chromatids fail to separate. So this leaves one daughter cell with two copies of a chromosome and another with no copies of that genetic information, or potentially, um, you know, and that's going to have uh, follow-on effects. If these gametes go on to fuse at fertilization, we end up with one of two scenarios, right? First, we can have a gamete with two copies of a chromosome fusing with another with one copy already, and that leads to three copies of the same chromosome, and this is known as trisomy. Or we can have a gamete with no of the, you know, none of this chromosome fusing with another with one, leading to only one copy of the chromosome, which is known as monosomy. Okay, this is usually compatible with, with life sometimes, um, but there is a very delicate balance between having too much genetic information and having not enough. Only some aneuploidies are compatible with life. Now, trisomy 21 or Down syndrome is one of the most commonly seen aneuploidies, and this is compatible with life. People with Down syndrome have three copies of chromosome 21, which happens to be one of our smallest ones in the genome. Now, people with this syndrome have really distinctive physical characteristics, such as developmental delay, uh, short stature, poor muscle tone, distinctive facial features, and they have mild, mild to moderate cognitive impairment. Now, trisomy 21 is an autosomal aneuploidy. Uh, it doesn't impact the sex chromosomes, it impacts an autosomal chromosome, and other common autosomal trisomies are trisomy 13 and 18. However, people with these aneuploidies are rarely live births, and if they are, they can usually pass away within the first year of life. 
Now, non-disjunction in the sex chromosomes can produce a really wide array of combinations which are also compatible with life. Kleinfelter syndrome occurs when a male has an extra copy of an X chromosome, so it makes their genome 47XXY. And this syndrome occurs from having a Y sperm fused with an XX egg or, you know, much more rarely an XY sperm fused with a, a, an egg containing an X. Now, it's surprisingly common. It actually occurs in uh, two in every 1,000 live male births, which is pretty incredible to consider. People with Kleinfelter syndrome generally present biologically male features. They do have an SRY gene after all, but as puberty sets in, they don't produce as much testosterone as XY males, so they can have some secondary traits that are usually associated with biological females, like less facial hair, uh, less muscle mass, broader hips, increased breast tissue, things like that. Turner syndrome occurs when the only sex chromosome present is an X chromosome or potentially one X chromosome and a partial X. So people with Turner syndrome generally present as biological female, so those, they have those physical characteristics, but they're short, they have some developmental delay and other distinct issues with different organ systems in their body. Now this syndrome occurs in one in every 2,000 or one in every 5,000, so between there in live births, so it's much less common than Kleinfelter. Um, and it's interesting to note that if a zygote only has a Y, so we can have a here a zygote only with an X as a sex chromosome, but if a zygote only has the Y, um, then this aneuploidy is not compatible with life. Now, there are a few possible, you know, there's a few other combinations of sex chromosome aneuploidies as well. So there's a large number of combinations we're talking that are compatible with life this time. And there's also the possibility of mosaicism as well. And when I say mosaicism, I'm talking there's a mixture of cell types of differing sex chromosomes in uh, the same organism. So regardless of the aneuploidy or chromosome abnormality, the most common way to diagnose abnormalities is through the use of a karyotype. And this is one of the loveliest karyotypes I've ever seen or worked on. So you can see all the homologous pairs are lined up. Um, and you actually, as a cytogeneticist, you learn how to identify each type of chromosome based on the bands, and it's a very slow process. So while you aren't expected to know, you, yourselves, aren't expected to know which chromosome is which, it's important to be able to see abnormalities given a full karyotype. So essentially, you're just looking for anything that looks out of the ordinary. For example, here is a karyotype that we can assume is a biological female. Here we see the two X chromosomes. This person, however, would have Down syndrome. They have trisomy 21 right there, so that would be their karyotype. 47 XX plus an extra 21. Here we have a person who has Kleinfelters. We can see really clearly they have two X chromosomes and a Y, so that's the kind of thing you need to be looking for. And this is a biological female, we can see with the two XXs, and they have trisomy 13. This is also known as Patau syndrome. Okay, so that their uh, karyotype there would be 47XX plus a 13. So please have a quick read. It's really important that you understand non-disjunction and aneuploidy and be able to use a karyotype to identify these ploidy changes.